Dixie here. I know some of the folks who have subscribed to this channel, especially the newcomers to hiking and backpacking, have gotten a little lost in the terminology when shopping for new backpacking gear. So my hope today is to clear some of that up by going over some of the technical terminology. And I'm gonna go from A to Z in alphabetical order. You can also check out these terms listed in the video description. I actually don't have a term that begins with A, so let's start with B for baffles. If you've ever wondered why your puffy coat or your down sleeping bag has horizontal or vertical lines on it, those are the baffles and they are there to help keep the insulation spread evenly so you don't have a dead zone like your shoulder over here is freezing because there's no insulation there and all of the down has moved over on this side so this side's like really warm. Anyway, it just kind of keeps things even out. The main thing that you need to pay attention to when purchasing a sleeping bag is the type of baffles that it has. So there are sewn baffles and boxed baffles. The sewn baffles create dead spots because it sews the outside material to the inside material and compresses it there where the stitching is. So your body heat can escape through that area because there's no insulation on those stitches. Whereas a box baffle has lightweight material between the two separated areas and that's actually the baffle, but it doesn't create a dead zone and your insulation is spread evenly. So it helps to keep you warm better than a sewn baffle. Base weight and pack weight. Base weight is the weight of your pack, excluding consumables like water, food, toothpaste, toilet paper, etc. Anything that's variable along your trip and depending on your trip duration because you're going to have more food on a seven day trip than on a four day trip. So to kind of compare apples to apples, base weight is just the weight of the things that do not change weight as they're used. Base weight doesn't include worn weight, things like clothing, footwear, watches, etc. And it excludes trekking pole weight because you're carrying them in your hands. And just to give you a baseline to go by, if you're wondering, well, what is a typical base weight? A lightweight backpacker has a base weight of under 20 pounds. An ultra light backpacker has a base weight of under 10 pounds. And then pack weight is your base weight with those added consumables. So it's what your pack weighs at the current time. And that's really what you need to consider. So if you're purchasing a pack and it's got like a max load weight or you know a pack weight of up to whatever, then, then that's the total weight of all of your gear and your consumables. And that's what you need to consider when purchasing a pack to know if it can carry the load that you're gonna have and also how comfortably it's gonna carry that load. If you combine the pack weight with what you're wearing and trekking poles, you get the skin out weight. Add that to your body weight and that's total weight. Big three, these three items are the ones that are likely the most expensive and the heaviest of all of your gear items. And they are your shelter, your pack, and your sleeping bag. Denier or D, as you might see on sleeping bag descriptions, tents, etc., is the measurement of the thickness of a fiber in a fabric. So for example, a single fiber of silk is considered to be one denier. So you'll likely see a number with a D beside it. And the higher the number, then the thicker the fiber of the fabric. Typically, the higher the denier a fabric has, it means the more durability it has, but it's also going to be heavier too. Drop is a term that you're likely to see when researching footwear, and that just measures the difference between the heel area and the forefoot, and it's measured in millimeters. So you might have heard of zero drop shoes, which just means that the heel and the toe of the shoe are the same distance from the ground and are level with one another. Just a heads up that a zero drop shoe or a more shallow drop in a shoe might take a little acclimating if you're not used to it because if you think about your foot, I know this is my hand and my arm, but imagine it's your foot, then if your heel is up high, it allows your calf muscle to draw up more. And then when that heel is lowered closer to the ground, it's gonna put more of a strain or stretch on your calf muscle. So that causes some people issues and then others, they put these zero drop shoes on 
and have no trouble at all. Of course, it depends on the individual. DWR stands for durable water repellent, and it's a treatment that's often used on rain gear, sometimes even sleeping bags. And while it doesn't waterproof the fabric, it does kind of help the water bead up and run off that way your rain gear isn't getting completely soaked and waterlogged and then sagging on your skin so it just helps things kind of you know run off and and not have water sitting on you and then in sleeping bags it's not going to make your sleeping bag waterproof for sure but it does help with condensation or if you end up dripping something on your sleeping bag you can more or less just kind of brush it off instead of it immediately soaking into the material now let's talk about f for fabrics shelters are typically made of woven nylon or polyester and then if they need waterproofing so like the rain fly of the tent or the floor of the tent then they can be treated with polyurethane pu polyethylene pe or silicone sil so if you've ever heard of sil poly or sil nylon now you understand where that comes from nylon is lighter and more durable than polyester so a lot of times you're going to see tents made out of nylon for backpacking because it is more lightweight but it is stretchier and it absorbs water more so that's kind of the downfall but there are always trade-offs with everything and the reason that this is kind of a downfall is that say you're camped out in just a gully washer it's soaked and now your tent isn't you know pouring in on you but the the fabric itself will hold on to that water so when you pack your tent up you've got that added water weight that now you're toting around until it dries out and it is stretchier which might not sound like it would be a problem either but when you set your tent up and and you stretch it out and and it's all taut and you've got it staked out and taut just means you know it's it's tight it's not sagging then potentially sometime in the night you notice your tent is getting a little saggy and you might have to fix it at some point if you didn't set it up super taut to begin with so that's kind of the downside of nylon but it's typically not a deal breaker for people while most of the tents that you see made for backpacking are going to be made out of nylon because it is lighter and more durable you will see sometimes polyester like sil poly tarps for example uh, because they aren't facing the same abrasion that a tent would so like the floor of the tent you're going to be tossing and turning on it but if you're a tarp sleeper it just goes over you and you're not constantly rubbing against it all night so some of those you might see made out of polyester another fabric that's used for shelters in the world of backpacking is dcf or dyneema composite fabric which was formerly known as cuban fiber until the cubic tech corporation was acquired by dyneema yeah it was c-u-b-e-n fiber not from cuba fiber dyneema composite fabrics according to their website are high performance non-woven ripstop composite laminates so the way that it's created apparently is the dyneema fibers are laid out in opposing grid formations and then sandwiched between two thin layers of polyester film and then they are melded together in addition to it being more lightweight than nylon and stronger it also doesn't have that stretchiness so it won't be waterlogged and stretched out and not taut this doesn't hold water like nylon and once you set it up taut it is there and it is going to stay the way that you put it unless of course your stake slips out of the ground or something but then that's just poor stake placement not the dcf stretching in regards to the weight comparison of these fabrics you might see something like 1.1 ounce sil nylon and if you're like what does that mean well that just means that one square yard so a three foot by three foot piece of this sil nylon would weigh 1.1 ounces with packs there are generally several different fabrics that go into one design and i have purchased a pack before because it was made out of a waterproof fabric so i won't say that people don't purchase packs based on the fabric that they're made out of but even with those packs I ended up using some sort of redundancy like a, 
a pack liner and then I kept my electronics in Ziploc bags, etc. I just think this is a good idea anyway because you never know when your pack might get a hole poked in it. So I would not rely on the waterproofness even if a pack is made out of a waterproof material. While it's definitely nice to have a pack that doesn't get waterlogged and that's really what I appreciate about that waterproof material like a DCF, uh, there are more important factors in my opinion like how does the pack carry? Is it comfortable? Does it have a max load for the gear that I want to carry? Does it have the capacity for the gear I want to carry? So to me those things are more important but certainly you know the type of material if you want a material that doesn't waterlog. If it also meets your other criteria, then why not? When you're looking at packs, you're gonna see many of the same fabrics that you do with shelters. So nylon, DCF. Also, a lot of companies use different trademark fabrics like X-Pack, Robic, Light Skin, Cordura, or the DCF hybrids that Hyperlite Mountain Gear uses, for example. Again, these are often a mixture of different fabrics and waterproofing materials. And when it comes to fabrics, especially these individual trademark technologies, you can really get in the weeds with all of this because if I spent the time to explain how all of the processes to create these individual technologies are different, then I could probably go on for like a million years on this video. So the main thing you wanna keep in mind is if you see a pack that is made with one of these individual technologies, their goal is to be more durable, more lightweight, abrasion and tear resistant, waterproof so the idea that these companies are using these individual trademark materials is probably a good sign finally with backpacking gear fabrics you're likely to hear about ripstop and this just tells you how the fabric is woven it's a fabric that's woven with a double thread at regular intervals to help prevent small tears from becoming much larger tears. Ripstop doesn't have to be nylon, but that's likely what you'll see. Fill power is a measure of the loft or the fluffiness of a down product. The higher the fill power, that means the larger the down cluster and therefore the more air that it can hold and help insulate. If it helps for you to look at it in a different way, it helps me to think about it this way, the fill power is the space in cubic inches that one ounce of down will occupy when it's allowed to fully loft to its maximum fluffiness. For example, one ounce of 900 fill power goose down is gonna loft up to 900 cubic inches. So it's going to bloom more or loft more than 800 fill power goose down. So if you have a 900 fill power down filling up a sleeping bag, you're gonna need less down of the 900 fill power than you would of the 800 fill power because again it's going to be fluffier so since you typically need less of the higher fill power then those sleeping bags are going to be more lightweight because you're using less material to insulate them so you might have a sleeping bag that has the same temperature rating but if you go with the 900 fill power down versus a lower fill power the 900 fill power is more lightweight because it uses less material. Gore-Tex is a synthetic, waterproof, and breathable fabric that's actually a trademark technology. In the backpacking gear world, you can mainly find it in rain gear and footwear. The idea is that it traps water from coming in, so specifically rainwater or snow, but yet it's breathable and allows water vapor out, so when you're sweating, the idea is that it lets the sweat out so you're not getting soaked from wearing this waterproof material. While Gore-Tex is probably the most well-known membrane out there, there are other technologies like it. For example, Hyvent, Event, Omnidry, and more. Mids. Mids are somewhere between a trail runner and a boot. They're basically in the middle, hence the mids. They're like a trail runner with a high ankle, so you have added ankle support but they're still lightweight breathable like a trail runner not as rigid and heavy as a boot our value is the ability of a sleeping pad to resist heat loss so resist 
R. The higher the R value, the more ability it has to not lose heat, so the warmer it's going to keep you. Just to give you a baseline to go by for three season backpacking, so spring, summer, and fall, you want an R value of at least two on a sleeping pad to help keep you insulated from the ground. And for winter backpacking, you want an R value of at least a five or more. Rainfly, this is the waterproof, floorless outer layer of a double walled tent. So you'll see the body of the tent that's typically mesh, and then the outer area will be the rainfly, which is the part that keeps you from getting wet when it rains. Therefore, that's why it's called the rainfly. If you have a single walled tent, you're essentially just dealing with the rainfly that has an attached floor. In hammocking, you'll also hear the term rainfly because if you're hammocking, you need to stay dry. So tarp and rainfly are often used interchangeably for the term to describe the piece of gear that keeps you from getting wet when you're hammocking. Seam sealing is the process of treating the stitched area on a piece of gear to ensure that it is waterproof. So you've got a piece of fabric that's waterproof, but now you've stitched it together with another piece of fabric. Where those holes go through the fabric, it's no longer waterproof. And it might not seem like a big deal until you're in a downpour, you've got a lot of snow on your pack and it's melting and then it seeps in. So seam sealing is often done at the factory when the product is assembled, but sometimes pieces of gear don't come already seam sealed. So when you buy a tent, a pack, etc., it's good to check the description and make sure that it's seam sealed, or if it's not, that at least you're aware of that so you can do it at home yourself. Some of the manufacturers that don't by default seam seal or seam tape they will offer their service to do so for an extra fee. So for example, anti-gravity gear, I bought some rain gear from them not long ago. And to me, it was worth my time and energy to not have to seam seal it myself. So I paid for a little bit of an extra fee for their services to do it for me. I figured they have way more experience with seam sealing than I do. Why not just get them to do it? I know that it's done right. But if you do decide to seam seal at home because it's not offered on the piece of gear that you're ordering or maybe you already had a waterproof piece of gear like a tent and now after some wear and tear over time you're noticing that the seams are leaking so you want to redo it there are a lot of videos and resources online to help you with that process stack height is used in footwear to describe the amount of material between the ground and the bottom of your foot and it can range from a barefoot type shoe or pretty minimalistic all the way up to a highly cushioned shoe. For example, on the brand Ultra, the King MT2 Spartans have a stack height of 19 millimeters, while the Temp 2s have a stack height of 29 millimeters. So there's a pretty big difference there. And then of course, there are options that are in the middle. The Ultra Lone Peaks that I use have a stack height of 25 millimeters. It's really just all about personal preference. Vestibule. When I first heard that word, when I was looking to buy a backpack and tent, I honestly had no idea what that meant. And I'm pretty sure I even had to ask but it's essentially like the foyer area of your tent. One person tents typically have one vestibule, two person tents often have a vestibule on either side. Vestibules are useful for storing gear at night that you don't wanna keep right in your tent in your personal space, but you don't necessarily want them to get soaked if it were to rain at night. So having that vestibule area is a pretty nice feature of a tent. Waterproof rating or hydrostatic head rating is a measurement in millimeters H2O, bear with me, <laughs> don't freak out when you hear all that craziness, millimeters H2O, but it's referring to the pressure at which water will press through a fabric or a coating. Now it isn't a measure of the thickness of the fabric or the thickness of the coating, but the pressure at which water will press through those things. How they go about testing this is applying water pressure to a sample of fabric until they can get three drops of water to press through. This means that a 1500 millimeter H2O rated fabric can have 1500 millimeters of water on top of it before the three drops are gonna go through. The higher the rating, the higher the waterproofness of the fabric, but just to give you a baseline to go by, anything above 1000 millimeter H2O rating is considered 
waterproof, but it's probably more like rainproof. You might see this rating in rain gear or in shelters. I've actually never really paid attention specifically to this rating, but it's probably not a bad idea, especially if you're gonna be in areas where you're expecting a lot of rainfall. All right, y'all, well, those are all of the terms I have for you today. I'm sure they are as clear as mud now. Hopefully they really did help to kind of break things down. And you can always refer back to this video if you find yourself picking out new backpacking gear and you're like, man, I know Dixie talked about this term, but I can't remember what it is. And again, these terms are listed in the video description so you can easily find them. If y'all have any terms that you remember getting kind of hung up on, it doesn't matter how basic they are, feel free to share those in the comments below because there might be somebody who's just getting into this that that could be very helpful to. Thank y'all so much for watching. If you found this video useful, don't forget to subscribe before you go and we will see y'all next time.